Здравствуйте. Меня зовут Анна Ижевска. Я являюсь кофаундером и организатором конференции Айтем. В этом году будет проходить уже в четвертый раз в Днепропетровске, 2-3 июня, куда я вас всех, конечно же, обязательно приглашаю. Конференция в этом году выходит на новый уровень, новый масштаб. У нас будет четыре потока. Поток IT-бизнес, поток Project Management, Sales and Marketing и Technology. И еще один поток сюрприз, который мы сейчас скоро анонсируем. Наша конференция рассчитана на IT-менеджмент Украины. Это не локальное мероприятие, это мероприятие всеукраинского масштаба. И если вы Project Manager, Product Manager, Account Manager, Delivery Manager или имеете свой собственный IT-бизнес в сфере аутсорсинга или продуктовый бизнес, то welcome to the item. Это конференция для вас. В этом году у нас очень интересные спикеры, можно сказать, звездный состав. Конечно же, Keynote спикером нашей конференции будет Том Гилб, вебинар с которым у нас сегодня. Но также очень интересные другие спикеры, о которых вы можете узнать на нашем сайте, который вы можете найти ссылку на сайт в комментариях к этому видео. Сегодня Том сообщил нам прекрасную новость о том, что на конференции он сделает не один доклад, а целых два. Том выступит в первый день в потоке IT-бизнес и во второй день в потоке... Кроме того, после конференции 4 июня Том будет выступать у нас с воркшопом двухдневным. И только что мы согласовали тему. Это будет Value Planning. И вы сможете посетить как два дня этого воркшопа, так и один из дней. Ссылка на страницу воркшопа также есть в подписи к нашему видео. Ну, а сегодня мы начинаем серию бесплатных вебинаров, которые будем проводить еженедельно в рамках подготовки к конференции. Эти вебина... Вы можете записаться на любой вебинар, который вам интересен, на любую тему. А чтобы следить за нашими вебинарами, подписывайтесь на нашу страницу на Фейсбуке. Мы там делаем все анонсы относительно как конференции, так и вебинаров. Ну, и давайте начнем, конечно же, наш вебинар, то, ради чего мы все здесь сегодня собрались. Я думаю, что Том Гилб – это человек, который не нуждается в моем представлении. Автор множества книг, большинство из которых стали бестселлерами. Человек, которого называют легендой. Человек, которого называют прародителем Agile. Его методологии используют такие компании, как Intel, IBM, Boeing, Ericsson, Nokia и даже Microsoft. И сегодня у нас пройдет вебинар в формате интервью. И модератором будет Дмитрий Миндра, который является членом нашего программного комитета и помогает нам делать нашу конференцию еще лучше и привозить вот таких вот звездных спикеров и отбирать интересные, актуальные для вас темы. А также благодаря Дмитрию у нас будет возможность скоро читать том, тома книги не только на английском, но также на русском и украинском языках. Спасибо, Аня. В течение сегодняшнего вебинара, если вы зашли на наше видео на YouTube, то у вас в левом углу появился тизер «Присоединиться к дискуссии». Если вы нажмете, вы увидите справа панель с вопросами. Вы можете как задавать свои вопросы Тому, так и голосовать за вопросы других участников. Наиболее популярные и наиболее интересные вопросы обязательно прозвучат сегодня в студии. И последнее объявление, и мы перейдем к вебинару. После вебинара у нас будет еще розыгрыш подарка. Скидка 30% на конференцию «Айтем». И я еще расскажу о том, как можно выиграть бесплатный абсолютно билет на воркшоп Тома Гилба. Поэтому обязательно дождитесь. Ну, а сейчас я с удовольствием передаю слово нашим спикерам. Let me introduce Tom Gilb and Dmitry Midra and let's start our webinar. 
Thank you, Anne. Uh, Tom, I think yes. that we should start from <laughs> from introducing uh, you a little bit for, to those who have not seen your books because they, they have not been translated to Russian yet or uh, so, so they were not so available to us and that's why uh, your methods and you are uh, so interesting to, to our audience. So I, I've heard from many people that you are called the grandfather of Agile. When did you start your work in uh, IT industry? 1958 I joined IBM and with, 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 with punched card machines for the first two years, no electronic computers. And the technology of the punch card machines was pre-war from the 30s, okay? Uh, and even the punch card machines, as you some of you know, had roots in the Jacquard loom weaving technology with punch cards from a few hundred years earlier. So I, I, if you like, I, I got into a several hundred year old tradition of programming automation and machines to weaving and uh, the first punch card systems I worked with were like uh, 400,000 punch cards, one for every automobile in Norway. <laughs> and that's, yeah, so nothing electronic, all electrical mechanical. But within two years, 1960, uh, we had electronic computers and we're programming them in the uh, pretty similar to what is today. It's amazing. So. Uh... What methodologies were you using back in those days for software development? We have some internet lags, but Tom Gillip is connecting. Yep, let's wait. Some minor technical different difficulties. I'm back. Did I go offline for a while? Yeah? Yep, but now you're online. Sorry, yeah, I, I got a message saying it was deleted because of uh, authentication issues. No idea. But all right, we're back, we're back. And if it happens again, we'll re go. Okay, so I was just saying the early computers used this punched card technology to get data in on punched cards and to print out results on the essentially the punched card. Uh, printers, which are all using plug boards. So we didn't program by writing code, we programmed by uh, moving wires from programming step number one to add A to B. So every so we would have a plug board about uh, uh, one meter by one meter sometimes and we would uh, plug all the logic with the wires going from one, it was almost like the early telephone plug boards. So if you had a bug, it was often just a bad electronic connection. And to find the bug, you just had to hit the hit all the wires, hoping it would go on and off. And you say, "Aha! The the bug must be there." And you put a clean wire in. That was debugging in the early days. Uh, okay, but uh, by, by about 1960, we were getting stored programs, and we were writing uh, programming logic as you would uh, see it today. But in the uh, first instance, we had no compilers or uh, we had a basically machine language where one might mean read a card okay and uh, or 65 might mean add and uh, we, we were uh, it was called it was almost pure machine language fairly early we got assemblers so it got a little bit more uh, like a compiler language but uh, as early as about 59, I think, uh, the first Fortran compilers came. And then early 60s, we got COBOL compilers. So we had fairly high-level languages uh, by the end of 50s. And for, for me, I was doing Fortran and COBOL at the beginning of 1960s. Okay? But even then, these were very ineffective, mostly. So many people preferred to work in machine language because we didn't have 
fast machines or uh, large memories. And therefore, the compilers had a tremendous overhead, which was unacceptable. So a lot of the early work was done in what we called assembler or autocoder, or things like that, which is pretty close to the machine language. Uh, as uh, computers got faster and memories got larger, then the overhead of using a high-level language like COBOL or FORTRAN uh, didn't matter. Interesting to record that today, if you go into a large insurance company that was in existence then, maybe 60% of all the programs they're using today are actually still written and maintained in COBOL from 1960. So it's, it's amazing, you know, we have 400 new programming languages being invented every year by some academics and 400 in total in use somewhere, and yet 60% of an insurance company today might still be that old COBOL essentially from the early 1960s. And people are uh, probably a bigger job to be COBOL program maintainer than Java or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so it still exists. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's it's amazing how long it lasted and and how. Uh, but but of course, uh, you know, programming uh, today is very different from. Uh, actually, if you think about it, one thing that characterizes program today is tremendous access to ready-made logic. But in fact, in Fortran, in the old days, there were extremely large libraries of logic and subroutine you could call. You know, just by saying call this and that. So the idea of having very large libraries of logic is not new, and it was there at the end of the 50s and beginning of 70s into uh, Fortran, which is probably the, the first interesting widespread high-level language for programming. Okay. Uh, so in, in a way, maybe very little has changed at one level. You know this? Uh, uh, yeah. But, uh, but people love to invent new programming languages for fun. And, and uh, of course, it makes everything incompatible with everything forever. So it's kind of messy out there. I almost wish we just stayed with Fortran and built better libraries and had one language and be done with it. But that's old me thinking aloud. <laughs> yeah, what project, what kind of projects people were building back, back those days? OK. Um, there was, uh, for example, I was working on things like a lot of invoicing, writing invoices for companies collecting money, a lot of uh, payroll systems, a lot of insurance and banking systems, okay? Of course, uh, a lot of uh, military systems, you know, uh, in Fortran for rockets and military systems and things like that. So that was, uh, things they were not doing were things, uh, uh, you know, anything like what we have on our uh, in, uh, smartphones today, you know, like Nobody was walking around with a computer in their pocket, forget it. In fact, most people didn't even ever think they would ever have a computer in their home, let alone a computer in their pocket, okay? Or a, let alone a computer in their car. I remember when the first microcomputers started coming out, uh, when we have early 70s, anyway, uh, Intel 4040, that type of technology, the computers were getting very, very small. And I wrote some papers and I said, one day, we will have maybe 10 computers in the car, your automobile doing different things, right? And you know what? I think probably we have 100 today <laughs> in, in, in my Tesla uh, doing different things. They're all hidden there. We just take it for granted. So I, I think people thought it was kind of crazy, the idea of having many computers in an automobile, okay? And my prediction of having 10 was ser seriously underrated. You know, every wheel has a few computers in the four-wheel drive Tesla and things like that, you know. Uh, the, uh, it's quite amazing. Um, every month I get a little message on my Tesla S, and it says, push the button if you'd like to have a new uh, Tesla, a new operating system. And it downloads, uh, because all the Teslas are connected to the net at all times, uh, things like new safety features, new braking, new steering, new entertainment system. Uh, it, it almost gives you a whole new car for free, okay? They, everything is improved and tuned. And uh, In fact, uh, one day they said, and uh, download this, and if you have the right uh, radar systems in your car, uh, you will have automatically driving car. And so, uh, you know, I had an older Tesla, and I didn't have the right radar system, so I didn't get that. But people who bought the car a year after me had all the right little radar systems, and they got a car that could drive automatically just by downloading software. 
And we didn't even know when we bought the car we'd get things like that. So this is an amazing new world uh, that you, there are constant improvement of things like automobiles in safety and convenience and entertainment uh, just by push a button, free download, and there's no extra charge. Okay, and it's getting safer, for example. Yeah, it looks like you're going to buy a new Tesla <laughs> very soon. Actually, my son Kai ordered his Tesla 3 yesterday, and I ordered mine today. But <laughs> right now I have a Tesla S. But the, the new uh, 3 that came out is half the price and uh, quite as good as the S I have today, actually a little smaller. So I think uh, in about two years' time when they will deliver it, I will uh, upgrade to an S, which is automatic driving, great safety features, four-wheel drive uh, uh, comfort, and one of the safest cars in the world. They've actually designed it to be, it is actually rated the safest car in the world. It's a great, great piece of hardware and software. I sometimes say that Tesla is a bunch of software that happens to have some wheels. Anyway, yeah. back, back to the 60s. Again, we could begin to see this was come, coming. As the computers themselves became chips and smaller, we could see the potential for embedding them in anything, and uh, as, you know, in the house, in the car. And, and so this is absolutely happening now at the car level. Uh, but what most people had no, it wasn't until, you know, the uh, like the Apple II and the IBM PC came out that people moved the computer into the home, as some of the listeners will surely recall. You know, before that, you, you, the big businesses bought uh, computers, even mini computers were not at home, they were in the business, and you, if you wanted to play with a computer, you had to get a job as a programmer or something like that. In fact, I remember this idea this is, you know, I used to be an amateur radio operator in the 50s, and I loved playing with uh, transmitters and antennas and talking to people all over the world. There was actually an internet. I could, from California in 1955, I could talk to people all over the world, like in Japan and, and uh, Australia, uh, from California. It's like we, we are doing now on Skype, you know, or, or Google X. But I could do that from my amateur radio. The internet was then simply radio waves and uh, Morse code sometimes rather than talking. So I had, but then uh, along came the computers and I thought uh, it's, it's um, quite amazing that I can get paid to play, continue to play with this stuff and program and fiddle around with the hardware. So I think everybody was quite amazed they could get paid for such a fun job. So we had a lot of fun. Okay, so uh, your one question you had was uh, systems. The earliest systems I developed were things like um, uh, invoicing systems for a clothing manufacturer. Take one example. And that's where I did my first agile projects. Okay, so short story. Uh, 1960, I left IBM after two years and got a job with one of their clients who had, uh, was going to do some invoicing systems, right? And uh, I had full control. I actually radically re-architected what the IBM salesman had sold of punch card equipment. We even got an electronic calculator, a 604 electronic calculator, which had 60 programmed steps. But we used plug boards to program the electronic computer, right? And I re-architected the system. And then I did something quite intuitively, which today we would call Agile. So this is my first Agile project. Uh, I, I divided the work into 20 steps approximately, and each step transitioned away from an older uh, electromechanical system of invoicing. It wasn't pure manual, but let's just say it used typewriters and punch cards. And I transitioned away gradually uh, from the old system, uh, at all times keeping the old system in place as long as I didn't have a replacement for it that worked, right? And step by step, I delivered an improvement. Things went faster, they were better. And step by step, in about 20 steps, in about a year or two, I transitioned to the new uh, com electronic computer, the program computer, and a much more advanced system. I made sure that every step delivered enhanced value to my client. There was something good they got. Okay? And they got feedback saying, it works, we love it, it's better, take more steps. Now, we didn't have a name for it then. For me, it was just common sense. 
don't use all this new technology which had just appeared. I mean, nobody knew how it worked. Nobody had an experience, right? And I had architected a new system that we'd never, you know, I'd never done it before, and nobody had ever done that before, putting all this together. So I'm, uh, uh, I very cautiously did one step at a time, made a change, made sure it worked, got my client to say, we like it, it's good, keep on going. And I was locking in the value. And then when that was successful, I'd say, okay, now we, take, we have learned something. We learned things we didn't know. We realized that step 10 we were planning should be done now on step three, that kind of thing. And looking back, I was doing what we call agile today. I like to call it evolutionary value delivery. But we were doing small steps of value delivery. And I wasn't doing it because I'd learned a method or gone on a scrum master course or anything like that. I was doing it because it was good common sense to do a little bit of new strange technology at a time, make sure it worked, integrate it, and learn, and then take the next step. For me, it was just intelligent common sense to do Agile. This is 1960. Was it a standard for 1960? No such thing. <laughs> no such thing. <laughs> what uh, other for you? No, I mean, the only standards that existed were the fact that uh, the, the manu computer manufacturers manufactured a machine, a computer, and they made their own standards. There was uh, virtually no standardization at the international level or even amongst the manufacturers. They just, they made the machines they made and there were no standards. Well, the nearest thing you had to a standard, the 80 column punched card was fairly standardized, but even IBM and Hollerith had made that standard. The companies made the standards, not an international standards organization. But um, uh, now, I'll give you another example. Uh, there were early versions of uh, high level programming languages, Fortran being one. But uh, uh, the US Navy discovered that they ha were using, uh, they had like 200 different payroll systems in the Navy. And a lady, her name is Grace Hopper can easily look her up. She's historic, and I knew her very well. Co uh, Lieutenant Commander, I think she had, Grace Hopper. She said the Navy has 200 different payroll systems in 200 different programming languages. This is silly. We must have one standard for the Navy. And she, in fact, did the work to invent what we today call COBOL, this language that still exists at the insurance companies. Okay. So she organized a standardization effort to standardize the programming language known as COBOL. Later, Fortran also got sent. So that was some early standardization of languages, but it was really just so the Navy didn't have 200 different programming languages for the same application, because that was the situation at the time. So that's early standardization in the early 60s. And uh, yeah, Grace Hopper was the uh, fantastic person who just made it happen by great personality and force of will, you know, that kind of thing. And what about software development and methodologies uh, about uh, standard, standardizing what people, how people were developing the software? Okay, yeah, okay. So uh, I think we could say nothing, but for example, uh, IBM uh, uh, held courses for their customers. I held some of the earliest ones and tried to give them some advice of how to do uh, thinking about business planning for putting computer systems in. So it wasn't a standard in the sense of an international standard, but it was standardized across IBM that they taught this, spread it around the world, okay? And uh, so there were early methodologies, but they were at the level of IBM had theirs and the other computer manufacturers had completely different ones. There was no such thing as an international standard in the early 60s. But people learned ideas like you should analyze some requirements and you should do some design and, you know, this, these kinds of th simple things. Okay? But there was nothing uh, like the uh, uh, things we see with Lean and Agile today. That was you know, many decades away. Okay? However, uh, I would often talk about my doing things step by step, which I called evolutionary delivery. Those are the terms also used later by the U.S. Department of Defense, evolutionary. You'll find in their standards, the standard 5,000 and things like this. But uh, when people would come up to me and say, well, Tom, 
I also do it the same way, one small step at a time, accumulation of steps. But we don't have a name for it. We didn't learn it anywhere. It just works better, and it's common sense. Okay? But long before the Agile Manifesto was published, uh, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense had made military standards, Department of Defense standards, uh, like MIL standard, I think, 498 and 5000, which were very explicitly not waterfall. They were very explicitly step-by-step uh, -step standards, which was radically different thinking at the time. Um, uh, up to about the year 2000, late 1990s, there was a military uh, standard called 2167 and 2167A. You can look these up. These were, in fact, waterfall standards. Okay? So people realized that uh, there was a problem with developing software, and uh, software systems were having big failure rates and big problems, and they were late. So somebody said, uh, these were people like my good friend Barry Bain, who's now a professor at USC, one of the great software engineers. He's very much alive and well. So he campaigned. He said, the answer is obvious. We must do engineering, not just programming. Okay? So they, uh, they then say, we must have a standard for doing the engineering. We'll call it a software engineering standard. So they, the standard 2167 was published, uh, and it described different things like requirements process and design process and coding process and testing process. And by the way, Mitra, I sent you a set of slides just now made by Craig Larman which documents this history, and we can put it on a website and uh, share sure. it with the people. Uh, we should probably ask Craig for permission, <laughs> but I'm sure he'd be very happy. I give it out to all my course participants. It's a great detailed history of Agile, if you like. Okay. But um, so what happened was this military standard was published, and now I talked with the man who made the standard. He said, I never intended this to be waterfall, meaning we do all the development and bang at the end of the projects is developed. I just intended to describe the different processes, but it got misunderstood as waterfall. And so we have all the people in the military and all the military suppliers, like Raytheon, etc. they're all doing big bang waterfall because they're all trying to follow the standard, which was misunderstood. So you might say the first waterfall project was actually a misunderstanding. Nothing better. But then everybody was doing it. Well, this was good engineering, but it still didn't work very well because it was too much at once. Okay? So finally, uh, uh, in about 19, uh, get, a, get a date, around 1988 87, Barry Bain himself, uh, who was, he was at, uh, uh, um, was it Space and Military Projects, was it called? Uh, TRW Systems, TRW Systems. And he took the initiative, because he was then working by also for U.S. Department of Defense, he took the initiative to get a what we would today call an, an agile standard in place for military. So this, this is the, I think it was called uh, Middle Standard 498, but uh, we can get exact uh, data from memory. I have a copy of it. This very clearly said, let's do it in small increments. Okay, so this is long before the Agile Manifesto that the U.S. Department of Defense has made a standard which is very clearly Agile, but they didn't call it Agile. They called it, same term I've always used, evolutionary. Okay? By, the way, By the way, what is the difference between iterative, incremental, and evolutionary? Okay, and I'll just give it to you. Iterative means repeating the same thing over like a cycle of delivery, tick-tock. Zero, one. Okay. Incremental means one, two, three, four, five. You keep on going in a sequence and you increment, right? But, and many people called these methods in the early days iterative and incremental. The early agile was called iterative and incremental. This is very bad idea. And I, I had to teach this to Craig Larman, who didn't agree with me first, but he finally did. He said, you must call it evolutionary. He said, why? I said, because the important idea is not that you increment, not that you go through the same cycle. The important idea is you deliver an increment and you measure and you learn how well it's working and what it costs. And then you change. That's evolutionary. So it's even official doctrine at U.S. Department of Defense that evolutionary means there is a learning and change cycle, 
not just following a plan one, two, three, no matter how stupid it is, four, five, six. Sometimes you go one, two, three and say, oops, I should go to step 23. Oh, I should go back to step 16. You know, you do whatever you do to succeed because you're learning what is working and not working in the architecture and the cost of the system. Now, already in the 1970s, there was a, an effort known as the clean room method at IBM. You can easily Google this, get books and papers on it. Led by the great Harlan Mills. I call him the Leonardo da Vinci of software engineering. And he was given a great task by IBM. This is 1970 already. So this is, where are we? Uh, 46 years ago, is it? Am I calculating right? Yeah. His problem was a problem we have today. If IBM wins a contract for software, fixed price, fixed deadline, very high state-of-the-art quality is military, right? And then they get the contract. What IBM experienced was they always used more time, more money to get to the quality levels before delivering it. And they had to pay a penalty for being late, and they had to pay money extra to get it done. So they lost money. Every time they won the contract, they lost the money. Uh, this is a situation. In other words, they couldn't predict what it would cost to do, but they, they did it, and then the Department of Defense made them lose, take responsibility, because they said it, it could do it quickly. So uh, IBM said, we cannot continue in this. We would lose money on every contract, and we're a money-making business. They said, Harlan, you're a genius. You're Leonardo da Vinci. Figure out what to do. Now, I'll make a long story short. Uh, I have, uh, in the value planning book, we have lots of references to the detailed information on this clean room method. Uh, you will get them in IBM Systems Journal number 4, 1980, and we have direct links on the web to them in the value planning book. Okay, But uh, what clean room did, it, did, it was actually the first large-scale agile. Okay, So in the 70s, you have projects like the um, uh, Space Shuttle ground software, okay? And what they do, if they have four years, they deliver the software every month, once a month, in 40 increments, what I call 2% increments. And at every increment, they measure the quality they've delivered, like the availability. We're heading for 99.98, but we're now only at 99.5, okay? Uh, we've used up half of our budget, but we only have we don't have, uh, the rest of the budget won't be enough to deliver the qualities. And what they would do at every interval, and this is a guy called Robert Quinnen who writes this, and I have details on it in, in my book. And Robert Quinnen says, at every step, we looked at the quality levels we're delivering, we looked at the cost, and we said, are we on track? Have we got the right architecture or design? If yes, continue. But sometimes the answer was no. And what Quinlan would do was very radical, even today. He said, then we must re-architect. We must redesign now on step three. Because if we continue, we'll use too much money and time, and we won't get to the architectural goal, the uh, quality goal of availability. So they would re-architect. Uh, he would re-architect with what engineers call design to cost. In other words, they would find a technology which would get them the qualities, but it could be done faster and cheaper, okay? Then they try it out. If it was faster and cheaper and they got the quality, they had found the right design and they could continue using it for the next 40 steps. If not, they'd have to try again. I call this dynamic design to cost. So this is agile as it should be. I'm not happy with normal Scrum and Agile because they don't, it is not agile as it should be. Agile as it should be would be looking at qualities and costs and Scrum doesn't even try, okay? And you can't manage large, high-tech projects by not looking at quality and cost, by just writing code. So that I, I'm really unhappy with Agile as we know it today. It's good that we're taking small steps, but we've got to do what IBM was already doing in 1970s. We've got to learn to measure the critical qualities. We've got to learn to measure the accumulation of time and money uh, costs. We've got to learn to redo the architecture in the middle of the project if the architecture you started with is not working measurably. Okay, So this very exciting idea, you're doing continuous 
step-by-step uh, -step architecture based on feedback and measurement. The achievement of Clean Room was that all the IBM projects were delivered on time, within budget, meaning IBM earned money, to the highest quality levels of military and space systems. That's recorded. That's a fact. Even today, most projects, yeah, I'll give an example. Jeff Sutherland at Warsaw Agile a couple years ago held a talk. He said, my Agile Scrum is better than all the other Agile methods because all the other Agile methods have a failure rate of 40%. Scrum only fails 19% of the time. And I'm thinking, my God, bragging about only failing one-fifth of the time. If a heart surgeon says, Look, I'm the world's greatest heart surgeons. All the other heart surgeons, two out of five patients die. I only kill one out of five of my patients. I'm proud. I, I want to deal with a heart surgeon that has no dead patients. Okay? Scrum kills one in five and is proud of it. The Evo method, the clean room method that IBM was using, had no dead patients. It had only successful projects. And my Evo method has only successful projects because it is the same thing. However badly we start with complex technology and new technology, we learn so early what is working and what is not, what it really costs, and we adjust. That's the only way to do Agile is an evo or learning method and a constant early adjustment. By the way, early adjustment, early measurement, early that's also known as lean. Okay? Getting yep. in there early, learning early. Okay? But if you don't measure what you're doing, the costs and the qualities, and you don't react early, and you don't change your design or architecture early, then you're doing this silly Scrum thing. Okay. By the way, nothing wrong with Scrum if you say it's a framework and we should add the engineering to it, but very few people have done that. Okay. Mainly they're just programming and they're not doing, they're not doing software engineering, they're doing software poetry. They're writing code. And they're very happy to write their code, but they do not take responsibility for high-tech, large-scale systems and making them succeed 100% of the time, which was already achieved by the clean room method and by my own methods from 1960, by the way, okay? Ten years later, IBM doing it on a bigger scale than I ever could do little me in Norway, okay? We have proven long since that Step by step, but with feedback and measurement, is the way to succeed with what we today call Agile. But most of the Agile teachers and methods people do not even know that to this day. But Craig Larman has figured it out because he's done decent research. I showed it to, to you. Okay. Yeah, but he's how... very busy. For, yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, so how, how is it possible? that we, we started from more advanced methods and ended up with uh, methods that are missing something. So you've told us that uh, they are missing some essential parts. Uh, was it an evolution? Uh, was Agile movement that started in 2000s an evolution to what, what was in 70s and 80s? Yeah. From the point of view of my many good friends like uh, Kent Beck and Jess Sutherland and uh, Mike Cohn, etc., uh, th they felt uh, they had read my book, Principles of Software Engineering Management. They credited it with giving them the insight that we should move from Big Bang to Agile. Okay? That's why I be became the grandfather. Okay? But unfortunately, I became the grandfather of the idea we should do it in small steps. But they didn't pick up the other idea in the same book, the idea we need to manage the qualities numerically and the costs. We need to be engineers. They failed to pick up the key idea. So all they got was we should do programming in smaller steps. But they didn't get we should do value and quality delivery, cost delivery in small steps. They didn't pick that up. So they were, from their point of view, they were making a radical and revolutionary important change. Okay? And I talk with people like my good friend Jeff Sutherland today, and he says, I understand and I agree with you, Tom. And we need to plug this into the Scrum framework. But you know what? They're earning so much money selling the Scrum framework without it, they don't have time to actually improve it yet. One day, it will happen. Uh, it turns out uh, the simple Scrum uh, uh, is so popular 
because it's easy. You, after all, you become master of the universe in two days. You become Superman in two days just by going on a Scrum Master course. And all you have to do is learn three things here and three things there. Don't burden your brain with learning four things. Okay? So it's, it's seductively simple, seductively easy, and the masses buy it as long as, uh, and as long as uh, uh, people will buy it, people will sell it, however elementary and silly it is. And let's say it's more than good enough for small systems, but of course there's a big movement in Scrum and Agile today to do uh, larger, more complex systems, the scaling up of Scrum, okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, as, uh, because they've realized it doesn't work on a large scale, and we have all these huge, even little Norway. Uh, I was today together with the work and pensions department. They have huge uh, national systems in a small country like Norway with six million in population, and they're using Scrum, but their systems fail so badly they have that the parliament has fired the managers. Not just the IT men, the whole managers of the Department of Work and Pensions were fired because it cost you know, billions more and years more and didn't deliver anything, okay? So even a little country like Norway has such large systems that Scrum alone is not enough. They were using Scrum and it failed, okay? So, uh, uh, yep. so we have this big interesting area, the idea, how do you scale up to larger systems with Agile? I believe the current answers are not good enough and I believe the answers with Clean Room and Evo are good enough and have been proven to be it. So, so what's next? Uh, Agile and so Scrum, Kanban, they are all uh, becoming widely adopted by companies in software and non-software uh, industries. And, and, what's they are fa and they're failing widely, <laughs> right? 40%, oh. 20% take your failure. By the way, that's total failure. Then we have partial failure, which is this big. So we have very few blindingly successful, amazing projects where everybody's very happy. Even the ones that succeed at one level, like people are happy, were a lot more expensive than anybody imagined and they were late. You see? But we, because success is when you do it as early as you said you would, as cheaply as you said it would, with the uh, quality and user friendliness and security you said you'd give. And people aren't doing that. There are very few case studies. There are some. But then they're doing things like the clean room method or the Evo method to get there. The normal agile, as you know, today is not succeeding in those areas. They have, they do not provide the case studies on the internet, in their lectures, in their training to prove they are doing it. Okay, clean room and my Evo, we have the case studies to prove it is working. We give evidence. The others just wave their arms and say it's very nice. And as long as some people will pay them for that, they take paid for methods that don't work and they keep on going. So it's, it's, uh, I'm very ashamed of our industry right now. I'm ashamed that people are stupid enough to buy stuff that doesn't work, and I'm ashamed that we don't have more successes out there to brag about. Tom, it took 15 years for uh, these methods to become uh, widely used. What yes. do you think would be popular in another 15 years, and is this new methodology or approach uh, coming or starting right now? Okay. Now, there are two, two uh, roads from this fork from now, right? One which should be happening if we were rational and trying to do the best we can. And then my answer would be engineering, engineers, real software engineering, real systems engineering. And Clean Room is a great example of real uh, software engineering, okay? And software engineering means multidimensional, quantified, uh, 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 objectives and requirements for usability and security and portability and all these technical things. Okay, now uh, this will happen and it is happening but only still in very advanced industries. Uh, organizations like Hewlett Packard and Intel and Boeing are using, for example, uh, my methods to do this. And in IBM, only in the defense and space part did they do this properly, not in the other part. So uh, I, I fear that as long as management will tolerate wasting money, time, and failure, because the problem is not the IT people or the software people. The problem is management is not managing properly. Management is not saying we refuse to pay for failure and wasted systems. We will write a contract so we don't have to pay you. Okay? 
until management starts managing and saying we insist on you being successful or you don't get paid then people will continue using bad methods but they'll probably call it scrum of scrum or lean scrum or some other fancy name and they'll they will so the majority will go on failing for the next 10 or 15 years at some point there may be a wake up call in management uh, that that will, or even insurance companies say we will not insure you if you don't do it properly. You know, some sometimes the only reason people drive cars safely or safe cars is that they couldn't get insured if they don't. You know, or there's a law saying you have to put on a safety belt. People are crazy. They will do stupid things as long as there's no law prohibiting it. They will do stupid things as long as they can get insured. Okay, so I, I'm afraid uh, the majority of humanity has shown for all the time I've been in the business. The majority will continue doing stupid things as long as they're allowed to get away with it and get paid well. And I'm afraid that is the future for the majority until some great event happens, like we all feel a death threat if we don't do things properly. Okay, But there will always be an elite of the uh, you know, high-class engineers, high-class companies. You know, Who knows, maybe even Ukraine will lead the way and show how to do this properly for the rest of the world. Why not? Okay. But uh, uh, but the problem is not the people doing it. Uh, the problem is the people buying it are stupid to pay so much money for so little results. So this is a management problem. You might say it uh, goes back to the business schools. Okay, One of the reasons I accepted the job of teaching at the Lviv Business School was to try to change the managers into rational human beings that could understand how to manage this technology. Okay, The business schools do not teach the simple idea of quantifying the qualities of systems to the managers. So the managers can only quantify uh, the money and the accounting and the financial accounting. They cannot quantify the quality of systems, therefore they cannot manage the high-tech systems yet. So we just we have a, a worldwide core of managers taught by really stupid management teaching emanating from American business schools like Harvard. That's our problem. Okay, right there. Bad leadership, bad management, bad teaching of managers. What can, uh, do you believe that uh, licensing software engineers or something like this can help us uh, to avoid this? No, no, no. We need to license the managers, give them a license to kill or to manage. <laughs> really, the moment, we've seen it before, the moment the management manages properly, all the software and IT people do good things in companies like Intel and Boeing and Hewlett Packard and IBM. The, 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 uh, you know, we, the techies of the world, we are smart enough and good enough to do the right thing. But if our managers keep on managing us in a poor way, we will continue to do bad things. That's history is very clear, and the, this is not going to change overnight because the IT people would like to do a better job. So our problem is management. Our problem is management of technology, and managers have abandoned responsibility. But they, they just keep on paying out lots and lots of money for bad systems, and then they say, well, that's normal, it, because it is normal, it's very frequent. And, and they, they waste money and they say, well, everybody knows that IT projects fail 40% of the time, so I'm not bad. Okay? If the managers were in an environment where half of the managers used these good methods, and succeeded 100% of the time, then they would look very bad, wouldn't they, if they failed 40% of the time or with Scrum 20% of the time. But now everybody's equally bad. And most people don't know what the leading companies like Intel, Hewlett, Packard, uh, 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 Boeing are doing. Uh, even in IBM, most people in IBM did not know that Federal Systems Division was doing the clean room method. I know, I asked them. They said, we never heard about that. I said, it's published in your own IBM systems room. Oh, we don't read that. We, have, we don't have time. Okay? So even within IBM, this great secret of how to manage high-tech projects with real software engineering was not shared widely. Okay? But IBM, the, why did IBM discover it? Because they had a simple proposition. If we can't figure out something like this, we will lose and we have to get out of the business. See? The other part of IBM stayed in business because all of the stupid managers bought IBM anyway because it was pretty good stuff. Even if they had a high failure rate, they did it. Okay? But IBM themselves couldn't continue with this stupidity because 
they had to get out of the business. The business logic said get out. Uh, companies like uh, the multinational companies like uh, I mentioned Intel, Hewlett Packard, uh, IBM, uh, Boeing, they are very smart people. Very far, and they realize if they don't get better, they will get defeated internationally. Okay? So they do this. Take an example, the banks. Banks are interesting here. Okay? The multinational banks like JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Citigroup, they are very good at using some of these methods because they will die if they don't because they have multinational competition. The moment you go to a national bank, let's just take England with Bar Barclays Bank and Lloyds Bank, they're, or the American, uh, some American banks like Lehman Brothers, they are too big to fail. When they fail, they do bad banking and bad IT, the government saves them. We even had this in Norway with our major banks. The government saves the national banks, right? As long as that safety net, no matter how stupid you do your business, like the banking, and how stupid you do the IT, the government will bail you out, then people will continue to do stupid things. Only the ones who realize, we will die, we will not survive, nobody will save them. You know, The multinational banks are is no national savior. They may be American origin, but they're really multinational. Mo uh, Hewlett Packard, multinational. Uh, Tesla, multinational. Nobody's going to save it. Okay, They have to save General Motors because that's American, but they don't have to save Tesla, it's multinational. So the, the multinationals have to find good methods, or they will die if they're not that smart. So the ones that have survived and survived, they find these good methods, which are have always been around us. There's nothing new about them, okay? And they make them work, and they survive. Okay? So what we're going to see is smart multinational businesses will find these good methods. They already are finding them, already been using them for decades and continue to using them. Uh, stupid, uh, uh, mediocre businesses and managements where the government will save them. You know, like, like almost all your government institutions will be saved by the government no matter how stupid they are. Okay? They will continue doing stupid things. They are not motivated, which is a shame. If there were a, 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 a national government which was really good, and there are some uh, national governments which are, okay, uh, then the leadership would say, let's do it the smart way. Let's save our country. Okay? But most governments uh, aren't that smart, not even the Norwegian government. <laughs> we won't even go there with Ukraine. Okay? <laughs> but s s some governments are, in fact, incredibly smart and do smart things. Okay? And any one government could say, let's do the smart things for our country, for our industry. Okay? But then you have to, uh, well, you have to deal with things like corruption, which is very lucrative. Okay, we don't have much corruption in Norway, but we have a lot of stupidity because we're so filthy rich with all the oil money. Now, good news is in Norway, the oil price has gone down, so now we're trying to get a little smarter. We can't afford the silly habits we had before. Okay. Sorry if I go on and ranting and raving, but I'll stop. No, 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 that's, that's no problem. I wanted to ask Anne if we have some questions uh, from yes. our uh, attendees. Yes, we have questions. Do you see them on the panel on the right? No? Uh, I can send you, if you would like, our questions to Skype, or you can... Uh, I would prefer to get them orally. Yeah, just give me oral, simple questions. You know, if you can read the questions, that would be fine. Uh, if I can read them, I can't see anything. <laughs> Where are they? Do you see the questions in the Skype, Dmitry? Uh, let Let me check the Skype. Give me I one. cannot see any questions, and we are not hooked up on Skype yet, right? We're on Google Meeting. Uh, I have Skype, but. It's better somebody reads one question right now in English to get going rather than we... Uh, I have one question. Can you tell us okay. your experience in building great team culture? I building think what? Uh, okay. Building great team culture. Great team culture. culture. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, again, I'm going to give a very simplified answer. Uh, I, I have a religious belief in the big idea for team culture, and it is this. All projects should have on the first day of the project, uh, they should establish the top 10 most critical improvements that the project will do. 
So I call these the top 10 requirements, the top 10 objectives. All of these should be quantified. There should be a number on the top 10 things, how great we will be, the degree of improvement. Now, we know we can do this because we regularly do exactly this. We take the first day of the project and we say, what are the top 10 most important things? And we quantify them. Now, what happens? Well, because it is quantified, it is exceptionally clear. The manager saying these things are important understand exactly what the improvements are. But the technologists, the hardware software people, also understand exactly what they have to do, and they can test and track and measure it. Now, if a team of 10 people or 1,000 people are all looking at these top 10 numeric things, then they will be synchronized in the direction of these top 10 things. They will be cooperating in the same direction. Now, the moment you do not have these top 10 things quantified, you just have the usual bullshit that uh, we're going to enhance the quality of life for people in Ukraine and reduce unemployment and reduce illiteracy, then everybody has their own different interpretation. So nobody is playing together on the team. They don't actually understand the objectives in the same way. And they go off and do their very best, but they're doing different things. Okay? So teamwork is destroyed if you don't have extremely clear common goals. Teamwork is enabled if you have extremely clear common goals. So that's my short answer. And most people are unfortunately missing this incredibly simple idea. One page, top 10 goals, first day, quantified, that sets the stage for everybody as a team working towards those goals. Oh, one more question. People are asking what do you think about the book called Mystical Man Months. Okay, Fred Brooks Jr. is a good friend of mine and has been a long time. In fact, I even have two copies of his book signed, one the original and one uh, the uh, 25th anniversary edition, which he gave me. So, uh, I thought Fred is a wise man. You do well to listen to what he writes about, okay? And uh, uh, so the, the, the book has lots of good advice, let's put it that way. But now remember, it was, uh, and Fred is a real engineer. In fact, his passion is engineering uh, chips and computer hardware, and not software. But he happened to get involved in very large IBM software problems very early, right? So uh, one, book worth reading, man worth listening to. Uh, however, he didn't get deeply involved in a lot of those things uh, like the engine. So there's a kind of a disconnect uh, uh, between what we're talking about here and what he's talking about there. He still has wisdom. He still is a wise man and well worth listening to. Uh, and there was one more question. Uh, what books can you recommend to people starting their project, uh, their uh, careers in project management? Would it be something like Agile as Scrum or would it be something else? <laughs> Absolutely. Don't waste any time on Agile and Scrum as it is today. Total waste of time. Guaranteed failure rate, 19%, according to Jeff Sutherland. So if you want to fail one-fifth of the time, use Scrum. Now, if uh, I, I, I'm very self-serving, but are we? what are we doing? Transitioning? <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, I, I, I would like to recommend a book called Value Planning, Done, written by Tom Gilb and Russian and uh, later Ukrainian translation by Dmitro Mindra. Uh, it not only is a, a book I would recommend, but it, it has about 100 literature references to other books and other people, people and other people. Okay, and you can get the first part of this book uh, free, and a very low cost. You can get the rest of the book. It is not a paper book yet. It is only digital but uh, more than half of it is translated to Russian and it's all available right now in English. And I, my heart, I, I've tried to write about the best methods and the case studies and the proven methods and give literature references to all the other great literature, not all of it written by Tom Gill, believe it or not. Okay? Cool. <laughs> There's will a be lot of good. great stuff out there. Yeah. So it can be used as a source for good literature, right? Everything yes. you can, can recommend is there. Absolutely. We have a 100 literature references, which are mostly free downloads. There are things like reading about the clean room method from Harlan Mills that I talked about earlier. 
These are free. These are great knowledge of a great agile. Uh, these are proven uh, to be superior to, to Scrum 35 years ago uh, in practice, published. What can you say? Scrum has never published as good results as Clean Room did. Okay. So uh, people are asking where they can learn more about Evo methods. Okay. Uh, n number one, uh, uh, I'm teaching them when I come to Ukraine. My friends uh, uh, in Ukraine, like you, Dimitro, are teaching them and can teach them. And uh, I will be teaching them at the conferences, such as the item conference uh, coming up. Uh, and uh, if, if you don't have the personal teacher, well, if you can read, and you can read, for example, Russian or English, you can teach yourself to learn about Evo. Cool. I think that we are uh, mostly done with questions. Uh, everything about Agile methodology you have answered. And if Anne has something to add, then and please do. Uh, no, I don't have questions. Thank you, Tom. Thank uh, you, more. Dimitri. Yeah, yeah, I have one more uh, uh, item to add. Today is a Fool's Day, and I know that you you celebrate it in Norway. What's your favorite uh, April Fool's uh, joke <laughs> or story? No, to okay, today in Norway, they published in the newspaper that all the refugees coming to Norway would be uh, allowed to live in the uh, basement or cellar of the royal palace. The king likes to, is a very good guy and would like to welcome all the refugees. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's funny. Tom, we would like to thank you for this webinar. You spent more than an hour with us sharing your experience and wisdom. And we would be extremely glad to see you at the conference itself. And some of us will attend your classes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting you all and, uh, and continuing to enjoy my time in Ukraine. I've always had a great time, as you know. We have fun. We go to a ballet and we eat good food and we have a lot of fun in addition to the technical talk we do. Yeah. Thank you so much. My we pleasure. are also looking forward to see you on ITEM conference. We are looking to see you in Alka and um, I hope you will share your comments and uh, ideas uh, with us about this webinar a bit uh, later. Uh, and now I would like to say some words for our audience about the conference. Дорогие uh, участники, тех второго, третьего июня будет делать два выступления. Две темы. Первый день в потоке бизнес доклад Value Planning. И во второй день в потоке технологии доклад The Paradigm Shift of Real Software Engineering. Кроме того, Том Гилл проведет воркшоп двухдневный 4-5 июня на конференцию и на воркшоп. Вы можете записаться прямо сейчас в комментариях и в подписи к этому видео. Вы можете найти ссылки для регистрации. А сейчас, как я обещала, мы проведем конкурс и разыграем билет со скидкой 30% на конференцию Item. Есть также в подписи к, этой, к этому вебинару. Заходите, находите последний пост и в комментариях к посту отвечаете на вопрос. Выигрывает тот, кто первым даст наиболее полный и правильный ответ. Итак, внимание, вопрос. Выигрывает тот, кто назовет наибольшее количество книг, написанных Томом Гилбом. Подсказкам вы можете найти эту информацию. Подведем уже в комментариях на Фейсбуке. А сейчас еще один конкурс для тех, кто желает выиграть бесплатный билет на воркшоп Тома Гилба. Что нужно сделать? Первое. Зайти на нас на Фейсбуке. Лайкнуть нашу страницу. Расшарить это видео и видео других вебинаров у себя на странице с хэштегом «Айтем». И по итогам всех вебинаров 
для тех, кто правильно выполнит условия конкурса, мы разыграем один бесплатный билет на два дня на воркшоп Тома Гилба. Так, и я, как всегда, хочу пригласить вас всех в Днепропетровск на конференцию «Айтем». Хочу поблагодарить вас за сегодняшнее внимание и надеюсь, что встретимся в Днепропетровске. А если есть у вас какие-либо ко мне вопросы, пожалуйста, задавайте, звоните мне. Все мои контакты есть на сайте. Я с удовольствием отвечу на все ваши вопросы. А мы уходим офлайн. Bye. Пока.